This is Lake. Lake, this is Dave at Dave's Auto Center out in Centerville, Utah. Hey, man, how you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. You know, we've never formally met. Well, we can, we can fix both of these things. I'm planning on being out in Utah. I just wanted to put it out there and say, hey, I can be there, and then, yeah, we can, we'll make something happen at the office. How are you, sir? It is the, the legend. <laughs> oh, you're the legend. No, you are. Lake, it's so nice to meet you. Gosh, this is so exciting. My boys are over in the other shop. Would you mind if I just kind of gave you a quick nickel tour of Love the place? Love it. would be great. That'd be awesome. This is kind of one side of our shop. This is where, and we just moved in here in August. I bought this. It looks brand new, it, yeah. Yeah, well, we're working on it. We're, we're trying to whip it into shape. But uh, the building, Les Schwab built this 20 years ago. And I thought it was going to put me out of business because I was next door. And my wife, I swear to you, 20 years ago, she said to me, maybe God's having them build that just, just for, for you. you. And I thought, have you lost your mind? <laughs> turned out she was right. <laughs> it was. So we turned this into a, a working shop. But what I liked about it was not only it was next to my building, because this is where I've been for 30 plus years, is it gave me all this extra space. Oh, wow. So this is basically going to turn into mostly uh, part storage for our engine kits, for our monster engine lines is where we'll be storing our engines. But this will be a kind of our bottom end shop. So this is our crank welder. Uh, yep. Uh, this is our wet mag. We got a $6,000 Mercedes Benz crankshaft. The picture looks better when it's all glowing anyway, but, but yeah, you don't even need that one. Wow. Wow, dude. It, it does kind of move with that parting line. You're right. I mean, and then there. it's 180. It's actually, Oh, really? See oh, it? oh. I've never seen that before. And, uh, Easy to, they're the other direction and, and they're with the throws, right? right? Mm -hmm. That's a weird place. I, I just think that that was from day one because it's on that forge party line. It very well could have been. And they missed it. So in here, this is, so our crank grinder, uh, just a lathe to make yep. things, and our balancer. We, we added this wall between the two buildings and the gates. Yep. And that gate there, so now what I did is I enclosed, because all this back here is yep. now this, yours. This, you have this whole lot. Right, right. There's Joey, my son. Hey man. This is where the magic really starts to happen. Oh yeah. And then uh, this is the machine shop. This is our teardown, clean area. Yeah, a lot of blocks. Yeah, we're building motors. And then uh, this is our head shop. Lake, this Pleasure. is my, my son nice Miles, and you've met Joey. So of course, you guys have your names in your shirts, because I'm terrible with names. That's, that's really helpful. We know, we know who you are, dude. We've been watching you forever, dude. We're a huge fan. <laughs> Lake just made it, you know, he was talking about our 6.7, the, the oil thing, about the, the starvation, you know, to the turbo pedestal. And he just reminded me of something we never even pointed out. That's best case scenario, because tell me, Joey, that machine won't fire a motor up until the oil is at what temperature? Like 105. Oh, 100. Okay, That's I thought it was like 150. Like barely over 100. Okay, okay, okay. But still, who's got 100 degree oil in their pan? Unless, Unless you're in Arizona in the summertime, nobody. Yeah, yeah. Nobody. <laughs> you know, nobody. The oil gets thicker as it gets colder. Yeah. All right. Well, it gets thinner as it gets hotter. Inversely, it gets thicker as it gets colder. And it's not linear. It's like logarithmic. When it gets to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, then gets down to say zero degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> it is exponentially thicker. So what you guys showed is essentially your best case scenario, even at 100 degrees. Right. Yeah. I could call it my four C's. Condition, cause, correction, confirm. My condition was I was getting all these six, seven cores from across the country because we're, we're building six, sevens like they're on fire. 80% of Rod, these cores are usually fine, but yeah, it'll grab the back mains. Yeah. Gra grab the back mains. The rod should fail before the mains because the mains are going to get oil right. before the rods. Right. So if you're failing a main, it has to be a lack of oil supply. It has to be. Yeah, but go back and look at your oiling system and say, where is it? Is it the end of the line? Are there a bunch of other leaks? Yeah, mains are the end of the line on that motor. Ahead of it. Yeah. And if it's the last one, then it's the last one to get oil. When they're specking out these lower viscosity grade oils, well, then someone says, well, I don't need that. I, I'm going to put my thick oil in there because that's what I've always run. Right. Now, all of a sudden, they could inadvertently, depending upon what climate they're in, they could be shooting themselves in the foot. That's the thing I think people have, have appreciated about, you know, Monster Engines, uh, their social media, and Dave's Auto Center social media. There are no secrets. 
They're just stuff that I don't know, you know? <laughs> That's how I like to look yeah. at it. I don't have any secrets. I, you know, there's really nothing that I wouldn't want to, you know, explain to people and let them in on. Who's well, the diesel is a very unique environment because the injector is in the combustion chamber. Direct and injection. Depending upon what you do with your tuner, right. you could be spraying fuel directly on the cylinder wall. If you start the injection too soon, the piston's so far down, it does not go into the bowl, it just goes on the cylinder wall. You know, diesels are trucky because here in the US, there aren't detergent additives in regular diesel. It gets made at the refinery, it goes straight in the truck. Whereas in Europe or other places, they actually have detergent additives in there. So it's, you really can't say, well, this guy over here has that same engine and they don't have that problem. Well, their fuel's different than we have fuel here. Anyone that's used, you know, say like, even like a power service, a Stanadyne, or even a Lucas fuel additive in their diesel has probably felt like, hey, this, you know, the engine sounds better, it runs better, get better fuel economy. Hey, yeah, cause your injectors are cleaner. <laughs> and it's actually able to atomize the fuel so it can therefore burn. There's like two eureka moments in my career where like the light bulb turned on. One, I was sitting in Houston, Texas, getting ready to take my certified lubrication specialist exam and I'm like, oh, I get it about oil. It's gonna do exactly what it's designed to do unless something externally, be it heat or contamination, affects it. The other thing I learned, I was right down the street at the Chevron refinery because I actually went to an ASTM school on fuels at that refinery right down the road from here. Here in Woods Gross. Yeah. Yeah, okay. When I was there and I was watching them make fuels and I was how they check it and understanding, you know, what the fuel is, how it's made and everything about it, I was like, oh, this is the what is affecting the oil. The number one thing affecting the oil is the fuel. The number one thing that's killing that oil is the fuel. And the poor the fuel quality is the worst job it does. And what we don't realize is here in the US, I can go get gasoline at a station down the street and that gasoline, regardless of what brand it is, I can go to that same brand in California, I can go to that same brand in Florida, it'll be three different fuels. It's not the same. Even though it's the same octane grade, the chemistry is going to be different. So like the one thing you should always do is like, it's a good idea to put some kind of detergent additive in your fuel, be it gasoline, especially diesel, because it's the best thing you can do for the health of your engine and for your oil. Because here in the US, it's just regular gas isn't all that great in terms of detergent level. Okay, when fuel added, because this is a question. Yes. It, it will help on intake valve deposits. Yes. How? Because we're not- Okay, so where it helps the most is actually preventing it in the first place. Right. Yes, the detergent additive in the fuel really can't help it once it's there, but it's preventative. It's, it's preventive. One of my t-shirts is, it says, uh, do, you, uh, do your maintenance, dang it, I'm busy. And my point is, I keep doing motors for no reason, really. Change your oil and do something. Exactly. are too busy. Exactly. <laughs> It's that, that's it. It really is. It's like majority of the stuff we do is lack of maintenance. <clears throat> it's simple maintenance. Is it, is it really that hard to do one oil change? It really isn't. This is one of your sayings. Uh, it, it's not, it's not speculations. It's science. Science. Yeah. science. Yeah. 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 It's science. Right. And the thing is, so like, I can really blow people's minds like, Hey, friction and wear are two independent phenomenon. Just because I reduce friction, does not mean I reduced wear. Yeah. Just because I reduce wear doesn't mean I reduce friction. In fact, like zinc ZDDP, it's great at reducing wear. It actually increases friction. Yeah. I have that look like I didn't know that. <laughs> See, I want everybody to know the gray hair does not make me that smart. <laughs> We've been working on this. This is one of our first videos is, is this thing got blown out of this block. Guy sent it to us from back east and uh we're gonna fix it but we the guy I sent this out to they did the cast welding on that to to see the work he did on this thing and and how he did that but uh he had this block in his own oven and he builds an oven around it with just like this white batting and stuff and he literally opens a hole in it yeah he'll move the batting and the whole block is like glowing glowing <laughs> 1800 degrees mm -hmm. and he's just work he just welds in this one area 
yeah. and builds it up with cast. 601 cubic inch. That's wow. it. Look, come check it out. That's why we fix, that's why we fixed this block. This is a rare block. Yeah, it is, yeah. So now we'll put billet caps on it. We'll, you know, straighten out the line bore, bushing the lifters. Let's uh let's take a I, seat. I, I, so you guys are engine guys and have that passion for engines. Well, my core, I'm really an oil guy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And to me, oil is that same kind of thing. Yeah. It's There's nothing in your modern life yeah. that isn't operating on a thin film of oil right. at some point right yeah your cell phone doesn't but the power came from somewhere Where, yeah even if it came from a wind turbine right. guess what there's a highly engineered lubricant in that wind turbine so talking about oil this is a question that we had uh, i'm going to give you our breakdown and i want you to critique it and sure. i mean that i want you to say nah, change that so yes. we built we build an engine every engine we build goes in our sim test yep our sim test machine, we're running Joe Gibbs braking oil, 50 gallons of that, ain't cheap, uh, but we circulate that through our, uh, through our sim test machine as we're uh, testing our motor, we're doing a running compression test, oil pressure, vacuum checking the cooling system, making sure it's sealed up. Then we either are bagging that engine up and shipping it. Mm -hmm. Now, when we built that motor, we are using uh, pre-lube, Okay. Assembly lube on the bearings and the rings. So when I assemble an engine, I dip, you know, a lot of people just take a little film around yeah. the ring. I learned this from him. Yeah. <laughs> I dip the whole damn thing in there. And then drain it out, I'll work, the, it off a work the wrist pin back and forth. Now, yeah. I've had a lot of people comment and say that they're never going to seat. I'm never going to seat those rings. I don't know if I've ever not seated rings, to be honest with you. Am I doing that wrong? So we're going to, let's start there. Would you, would you say better way to do that? Am I overloading it with oil? Possibly. But the reality is by the time you've assembled the engine and done all this, you've probably given it time to get back off, but you really don't want that oil film on the top of the piston. Greater well, chance like for that to be, become a deposit. I mean, the fuel is going to wash it away. That thing's probably going to move away, but I would rather not. If it was me, light film, light film on the skirts, you know, put the assembly lube on the wrist pin before it put, gets in there. That's all you need. Okay. The thing that you're doing over there, that's the good part. Right. Okay. Okay. And you're using the right chemistry. Now I'm a bit biased because I may have formulated that product, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I did. Yeah. Okay. I, I formulated that. Uh, okay. But that's it's designed to do that job. So that it has that higher level of ZDP, right. lower level of detergent, so the ZDP can do its job. And what's nice about that is it can handle a wide variety of surface finishes and materials right. and establish the anti-wear film to allow those parts to mate together. So by the time that engine comes out of that sim tester and gets put into a customer's vehicle, you've actually already put them down the road, the right direction, a pretty good bit. Let's continue my, my quest here to, to get better on our, our new, in, our, our remanufactured engines. So we're, we're running them in the sim test. We're now going to install them in a truck or a car. We're not using like a full synthetic. We'll just use a semi-synthetic. For the first hour. 30 minutes. Okay. 30 minutes. But you're to saying to avoid the straight 30. Because the straight 30 oils don't have any additives in them at all. The old school thought process was, and you got to think back, where do these things come from? Because every little we'll call it myth or practice right. does have some nugget or kernel of truth where it began where the whole idea of straight 30 weight, wear the engine in, non-detergent style. Cast rings. Chrome rings. Yeah. When chrome rings, they were so daggum hard and you had to you know, hone them like a 220 grit or, right. or 280 grit, and that's how you finished it. It was really rough, so you had to run in that chrome because that chrome was lumpy and bumpy. <laughs> if you could graph it out, like if zinc is on this axis and wear is on this axis, when you have very low zinc, you have very high wear. As you add zinc, it starts to drop. You keep adding zinc, it goes back up. So over here is adhesive wear. That's metal on metal contact. Over here is corrosive wear. Think about scraping paint. If the paint's really thin. Folks, if your brain is getting swelled up, just uh, take a couple of deep breaths and stay with, it. Stay with us here. Just stay with us. Keep, there's, there's a payoff. Keep going, keep going. When the paint's really thin, it's really hard to scrape off. The paint's thick, it just like butter. So that thick ZDP film from that higher level of zinc, it's just corrosive wear. 
because the zinc actually reacts with the metal surface and creates a film. It's not on top, it's actually bonding with. That's why I said, you're actually breaking in the rings over there in the sim tester because my chemistry is so active on the ZDP side that I'm chemically wearing those surfaces together. I don't want it to go uncontrolled mechanically. I'm a, I have controlled chemical wear with the additive package that's in that oil. And you're starting the process right there in the sim tester. What I would do is I would put that same oil in the engine and then go run it for that first 30 minutes or so, come back, drain it out. Then they can put whatever, then you can go with whatever. With the manufacturer's recommendation. Yes. So when they began to reduce the amount, the amount of zinc in the oils to extend catalytic converter life, that started in the early 90s. So prior to the limit, there was nothing, no limit on the amount of zinc in the oil. But most oils were gonna be in like probably a 1200 to 1500 parts per million ZDP range. And they came and put a limit of 1200 on there. It didn't affect anybody building engines anywhere. Why? Because that level of zinc at that time with the amount of detergent in the oil was just fine. Oh, by the way, catalytic converters, they lived 80,000 miles anyway. But when the EPA wanted them to go further, say 100,000 miles, right. 120,000 miles right. on the cat, they could either put more platinum and palladium, bigger converters in the car and cost them money, right. or we can reduce the amount of zinc in the oil. Uh, That's cheap for me, yeah. yeah. That is cheap. Right? I gotta buy zinc. It saves, it saves everybody money, <laughs> right. right? So here, we just make it less zinc in the oil. It wasn't until 2004 when the zinc levels got down to 800 parts per million, and then the calcium levels went way up because the detergent levels had been increasing. So while the zinc levels were going down, detergent levels were going up, and it was 2004 is when you hit that critical mass where the zinc levels were low enough, detergent levels are high enough, that every flat type of camshaft in the world all started to die. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's when I was at Gibbs and yeah. we came out with the break-in oil and all that kind of stuff and it was the whole thing. That's where the oil story began. But the point being is even at 1,500 to 3,000 parts per million ZDP, which is what's in that oil over there, you can go 100 miles, it's not gonna hurt the cat. Right. So to recap, run the sim test with the, with the Gibbs break-in oil, mm -hmm. use the Gibbs break-in oil, in the vehicle, mm -hmm. running it the first hour. Is that enough or would you leave Absolutely. it Absolutely. It's all it takes. Oh, okay. You're saying it starts here. We're done here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, the chemistry is going to do what it's designed to do in 45 minutes to 60 okay. minutes. All right. I got a question about the chemistry. Now that you're talking the ZDP, how it, it's bonding with the material, mm -hmm. am I diluting the ZDP in that by you know running it through so many motors? Does the ZDP Level, uh -huh. ZDP level drop in that machine. If you clean that machine out, put brand fresh oil in it. Ran 100 motors. I mean, we take, a, take a sample of the oil, right? Right. Take a sample of the oil, analyze the oil, look at the phosphorus level. Because it's the phosphorus, the P in ZDDP, that actually does all the work. It's okay. not the Z, it's the P. And you ran 100 motors through it. Uh -huh. But it say at 25, at 50, at 75, and then finally 100, we took a sample at each of those points, you would see that phosphorus level drop because it is taking it out because the oil is a carrier for it. And right. as it's moving through there, it is leaving. So yes, it is depleting over time. Gotcha. Huh. By the way, everybody out there that wants to know uh, how to get their oil checked, uh, the chemistry, this guy's company yep. would be the place. Yep. And we'll leave you a link at the bottom of this video. So watch and uh, we'll give you a link to it. It's, it's science, not... Speculation. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> the mistake that I see more often than not, people baby their cars. Yeah. Cars are meant to be driven. I, I see it the... I totally agree with this. You listening to Highway Patrol? <laughs> yeah. I see it the most in like the guys who have Porsches and stuff. Yeah. They go buy their brand new Porsche and, it's, and they, they've waited their whole life for it, right? So I get it, I mean, like, this is a big investment yeah, you know, and they don't want to hurt it and they, they, they want to baby it. It's meant for the Autobahn, yeah. <laughs> not for cruising it's, the parking lot. Yeah. Not you know. cruising around Centerville, Utah. <laughs> Piston rings need load to break in. It's not the static tension of the ring that makes it seal. It's the combustion pressure yeah. that pushes the ring out. If you don't drive it, if there's no load, it won't seal. And I'm telling you, some of the rings today are like a piece of wire. I mean, there, there's no tension on them it's at all. It's a proper piston ring. Huh? It's a proper, proper piston, piston ring. It's like a total seal. He's piston still piston old school. <laughs> I know. Well, the thing is, I, I, I love it because in the old days, me, yeah, 16th ring was big. 
And then 043, well, that was a racing ring. Right. Well, today, those same guys run a 0.5 millimeter, 0.6 millimeter, two millimeter ring, but it will go three to four races yeah. without ever touching the short block and make the same powers it did brand new. Right. That old school, small block Chevy that had that 564, <laughs> 564, 360 and, and Here's how you spread it. <laughs> that giant ring was just wearing away yeah, the cylinder bore. Right. Now, we have, yeah, obviously harder materials today. We have thinner rings, better materials, better coatings that can reduce the friction. We do all that, and in the end of the day, you come up with a better piece. It's just material sciences, advancing what we're doing so the engine becomes more efficient and lives longer. You sent us a, a set of rings, uh, gapless, we're, we're uh, speed of air technology. Yeah. Yeah. Bill came by and, and uh, we're, we're using his pistons now in some of our monster engines, mm -hmm. uh, the upgrades and stuff. Fascinating. Fascinating stuff about uh, reducing exhaust temperatures in the mm -hmm. diesels. He's saying that this is a better piston for direct injection. And uh, you sent us a set of piston rings, gapless second ring. So tell us about the, the ring package that we're gonna be using on these pistons and why we wanna use this upgraded ring package. So for a diesel, one of the key things is that fuel is the enemy of your oil. You know, the oil's gonna do its job. It's contamination that causes the oil to break down. Well, the number one source of contamination in a diesel is soot. That's why a diesel ring pack is different. So that top ring, for example, is a keystone style ring and they use this in the top ring in a diesel because of all that soot wants to get in that ring groove and cause it to stick but this is basically self-cleaning because the ring's always rotating and the piston's rocking a little bit so that rotation and that rocking motion allows this to act like a scraper and break up that soot to keep it from locking the ring in that top ring groove mm -hmm. we pulled the cummins down and this ring was thin. What caused that? That was the soot wearing it away. Soot is what wears out a diesel engine. When, say, Caterpillar, Cummins, Mac, when they do oil testing for a diesel engine oil, uh -huh. they pre-soot the oil. They take carbon black, that will, basically hard carbon particles, yeah. and they load the oil full of carbon initially to run a 150 or 300 hour test to get it to wear the engine they have to pre-soot the oil, otherwise it won't wear out fast enough. The keystone ring in there is designed that way to clean off that soot. That's yes. why it's a keystone. Yep. That's why we're not gonna get away from the keystone nope. on the diesel. Nope. Okay. So what we've done differently in the second ring here is opposed to having a traditional gap second ring like you normally see, what we've done for, the, for your engines here, for that package, is we've made it gapless. So a gapless ring isn't a ring without a gap because this is a gapless ring package it's essentially two overlapping rings. Now the engine does not know that there's a gap. And the key for this goes back to what we said, mentioned earlier. Contamination is the enemy of your oil. This is a physical barrier to that. So that little 20, you know, 15, 20 thou gap uh -huh. is allowing enough soot to get by to hit the oiler ring, uh -huh. then it's down in the oil Actually, and, not. and then we're, we're running downhill. Yep. Gotcha. Two things that that gapless second ring does. It keeps the soot out of the oil. So it greatly reduces the amount of soot getting into the oil, which does two things. Extends your engine life. Right. And extends your oil life, life. right? Yeah. The other thing is just putting that little gapless ring in that second ring groove, it cuts your blow by in half. We did a test and at Jamie Waggler's, right? Uh huh. With one of their Street Fighter Cummins engines, right? Street Fighter. Oh, engines. the Waggler, Waggler, man! The guy makes wild stuff. Three thousand horsepower diesels is insane, <laughs> right? At an eight hundred horsepower tune-up, going from a conventional second ring to a gapless second ring, not only did it cut the blow-by from basically ten inches of pan pressure to five, it picked it up forty horsepower. Blow by creates vapor. Vapors create that crap that we're, you know, getting in our manifolds that we're pumping down through our cats, our SE, our uh, EGR, yeah. yeah, all that stuff. So any time we can reduce crankcase pressure, hallelujah. Oh yeah, because that's it. It's like clogging arteries and stuff, right? The more vapor moving through the EGR system, the shorter the EGR system life is going to be. So if I can cut that in half 
you essentially double the life of your EGR system. And you and the horsepower increases because you don't have that pressure pushing on the back side of your pistons. And yeah. yeah. And anytime you reduce That's like free bonus. Well, yeah, that is. That that's great. That's not why you do it, but it's a nice little bonus package to get. Now if I do in a second gapless and not a gapless on the top, do you risk mm -hmm. ring flutter with your top? Ooh. Yeah. Good, good question, Joe. Right. So, because that, that's a great thing, though, because right, that's a question people have about having a gapless second ring. So you got to realize, for that top ring to lift off, it has to be a differential in pressure. And a forced induction engine doesn't happen. That makes sense. What is something that would be acceptable on a diesel daily driver for oil consumption on a? Uh, on a, on, a, on a motor that's been well maintained and you know we've got 50,000 miles on it. What, what uh, if, if you surveyed all the different OEMs, you're going to get something in the neighborhood of about one quart per 1,000 miles, miles is what they would deem acceptable. Okay, so that's the answer to that question. Gasoline? Same thing. Same thing. Okay, next question. Uh, I get a lot of motors tore down. And I, people, I quiz people, you know, uh, I want to talk to the patient, get the patient's history. So I quiz the customer when we have a motor that fails, whether it's a diesel or a gas. And I'm like, where was your oil change interval? You know, mm -hmm. how good, how faithful were you? Some people are clueless. It's a question, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a statement. My theory is the manufacturer's recommended service interval is only for them to get that thing out of their warranty period. I don't think they're that concerned with the longevity and durability of that whole system. I do not see the benefit of waiting 10 to 50, you know, even 7,500 miles to change your oil. Am I wrong? No. <laughs> <laughs> so let's put it this way. Yes. <laughs> Those longer drain intervals are because they get credit for their cafe, their corporate fuel economy average by having longer drain intervals because that means less waste oil that goes into the environment. Also, it lowers the cost of ownership. Is 10,000 miles, 15,000 miles, is that what's best for your engine? Absolutely not is what's best for your engine. Yeah, I knew it's, it. It's what I gets them it. through the warranty yeah. and checks other boxes for them. So it's really not about a magical number. There's not a magic drain interval number. It's all about how you use the vehicle. And the better the quality of the fuel is, the environment, every... It, there's so many factors that play in, and what kills me is there are so many cars that have maintenance indicators on them. They're just clocks. I know. Right. Or uh, I mean, they're not it's smart. Not like, test. like at least right. the GM ones. There's an algorithm. Algorithm. To to idle it. time. Uh, how length of right. 60, right. 70 mile an hour time. Right. Well, like my daughter's Toyota. That's a clock. It's, okay. it's mileage based. Right. 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 Yeah. Nissan, it's mileage based. Yeah. Hey, on our warranty statements, on all our engines, we require a 3,000 mile change or, uh, oil change interval. We do. To, to retain our warranty, which is one of the best in the industry, I require a 3,000 mile oil change. And people are like, well, that's more than the manufacturer. And then I kind of look at them and say, my engine's going to go a lot longer than yours. We're, we're the manufacturer. You know, yeah. I'm the new manufacturer. Right. There's a reason your engine was here in the first place. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes you see the light go on in their head and they're like, okay, I got it. Yeah. If you really want to have that vehicle long term and get the most life out of it, the only way you're going to know what's best for your engine, where you live, how you drive, is to do oil analysis. If you don't have data, you're just guessing. Yeah. You know, the people that invented used oil analysis was the U.S. Navy during World War II. Let's actually do, you know, predictive maintenance, not time-based maintenance, when it was necessary. When the oil analysis told them to do it, they had less failures overall. Because now you had less chances of someone doing something wrong, contamination getting in the system, that fewer maintenance-induced failures. The reliability went up. Anyone that's ever flown on a commercial airline can thank used oil analysis for keeping you alive because they all do it. It's the backbone of most industries, but it's almost unheard of to be done in the automotive industry, which is a crying shame. So you see how the motor oil geek and Total Seal, how it all works together? Yeah, I do. I see. Yeah. I see. It's, There's it's, synergy here. Yes, I see that. Yes, absolutely. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Oh man, thank this you. Was, hey, the sun awesome. came out too. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs>